House Speaker Mike Johnson's laying out a plan to take on the Justice Department following Donald Trump's conviction last week. During a news conference yesterday, Johnson announced a three-pronged approach to curb the DOJ's authority using legislation, congressional oversight, and the appropriations process. In his remarks, Johnson accused Democrats of orchestrating Trump's many legal issues in order to prevent him from winning in November. When the verdict came down against President Trump, there was something palpable that happened around the country. People realized that we have reached a new low. And when you have activist prosecutors and the Democratic Party who are so desperate because of the presidential campaign and the way it's going, they understand that Donald Trump, the, all the polling shows, is crushing Joe Biden. They're in, they're in panic mode. They see this happening and they're so desperate to stop him that they are willing to use the judicial system to do so. It is a new low. And it's a dangerous one because what they're doing is they're eroding the people's faith in our system of justice itself. Joining us now, MSNBC contributor and author of the book, How the Right Lost Its Mind, our friend Charlie Sykes. Charlie, let's start by fact checking the speaker there. Mm -hmm. Almost all of what he just said uh, is not true. But I'll give you the floor um, and, and just weigh in here about your analysis of what he had to say and its impact on Americans' faith in our system of justice. Well, it is interesting how congressional Republicans are all in on this. I mean, it was, as you point out, um, a, a, erroneous. It was it was demagogic, uh, but also an indication of the, the way that that the Republican Party is all in, not just in supporting Donald Trump in spite of his criminal behavior, but embracing embracing his attacks on the criminal justice system. So they're all in on obstruction of justice, uh, possibly trying to shut down the Department of Justice, which they won't be able to to do. Um, but also uh, Donald Trump's uh, pledges of vengeance and ret retribution. And, you know, I, I, I think that, Jonathan, one of the, the tasks that we, we sometimes have here is, is is not to become numb to all of this. You know, it is, it is one thing to say that, you know, Donald Trump, uh, you know, that, do you know, Donald Trump is turned the Republican Party into a cult, but the extent to which the Republican Party has transformed itself from the party of law and order to the party of we will defend Donald Trump um, at all costs is really, really remarkable. Yeah, and, and we're, seeing, we're seeing here Johnson talk about stripping DOJ of funding. I mean, that's defunding the police, if you will, which, of yes. course, was the attack Republicans used a few years ago. So, Charlie, let's dig into this a little further. I know you did in your new piece on yeah. Substack with the headline, Trump's cheerleaders for vengeance. Tell us a little more about this dynamic and, and compare it, if you will, to what we saw in 2016 when that Hollywood Access tape dropped and, and, and now the evolution of the Republican Party from the response there the response now after the verdict. Yeah, this was something that I that originally written for uh, the Atlantic Daily Newsletter. Um, you could really think of last Friday as a as a bookend for the transformation of the Republican Party. You know, back in October 2016, after Access Hollywood, there was at least some soul searching. I mean, they didn't find anything there, but uh, there was there was a, a decent interval where Republicans said, "Can we go along with this sort of behavior?" Now, flat you know, fast forward to what we saw last week. There was no hesitation whatsoever. It felt as if all of the, the statements of support were, were pre-written. And then again, um, the number of prominent Republicans and conservatives who basically said that, you know, that not only um, is it wrong that uh, Donald Trump was prosecuted, but we now need to go after Democrats. And so it is this, you know, it, it, it's sort of easy to think of this as as just Trump's vindictiveness when he says, I am your retribution. But I think what's increasingly obvious is that he has a substantial constituency for the politics of retribution and that his base will be demanding it. And as you're seeing from Speaker Johnson, there's a very real possibility that Republicans will, in fact, support a Trump 2.0 uh, uh, presidency of vengeance. So let's take an, another look at the aftermath of the verdict. We just covered sort of the hard right Republicans. But let's get your read on how it's playing with average voters, sort of those independents and swing voters. We see a little movement in the polls, not a lot, at least not yet. But you're in Wisconsin. You're talking to people each and every day. Is this verdict going to resonate even just a little? And in a close race, might that be enough? Well, there's 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 two reactions. I mean, obviously, uh, the the Republican mega base is fired up about this. They are angry about this, but they're not the ones who are going to be determining the outcome of this election, as you point out. Um, and and I just I remain incredibly skeptical of the notion 
that that any felony conviction uh, by Donald Trump and the fact that he continues to face felony charges is in any way a political asset going into November. I have a hard time imagining independent voters who have been skeptical of him in the past saying, yes, we're going to vote for him now, especially as, the you know, we're, we're now about to have, you know, five months of Democrats and the media describing Donald Trump as a convicted felon. I mean, there's going to be a lot of whataboutism. There's going to be a lot of level the Hunter Bidenism and, and the weaponization of the criminal justice system. But the reality is that Donald Trump's character, his behavior, and his fitness for office is uh, is is on the ballot. And um, it is not uh, being portrayed in the most positive light when you have a jury of his peers saying, yeah, he's committed 34 felonies. Yeah, and on a closing note on that, it does seem like there's more and more pressure among Democrats to make this a bigger issue, to not just ignore it. We heard from President Biden at his fundraiser in yeah. Connecticut this week talk about it, that the Biden campaign Twitter account has repeatedly uses the phrase convicted felon. As one Democrat had put to me, it's their job to make sure this sinks in. That's what the campaign is going to be for. Charlie Sykes, thank you so much as always. We really thank appreciate you. it. And thanks to all of you for getting up way too early with us on this Wednesday morning. 